Great. I think uh, we can get uh, started. So it's a great pleasure to have here today Nicola Nozengo, uh, that uh, among many things is our new communication uh, personal officer, as we say, uh, for the NCCR Marvel. So this is a chance uh, uh, both to introduce Nicola, but also to introduce the communication activities that he oversees, uh, because these are ever more relevant uh, in one side of the current scientific landscape, uh, but also there are stricter requirements uh, from uh, the National uh, Science Foundation that funds uh, uh, many of you here, uh, here today. So what I wanted to do was uh, uh, to introduce uh, the session, give you a little bit of background of what does it mean uh, to have a communication strategy and articulate it. So we have a few slides uh, of uh, you know, the way we have declined uh, these strategies in the last uh, few years. Uh, and then uh, maybe we go really on a discussion uh, with Nicola uh, so that he tells you more on you know, what is his role and how you can all you know, benefit uh, very much uh, for his uh, precious contribution uh, to the effort. Uh, everyone is welcome uh, to ask uh, questions. In remote, you can just uh, raise your hand or uh, type something in the question and answer. Uh, and here uh, you can raise your hand, uh, basically. And uh, at the very end also, we'll have a reminder on uh, what are, uh, again, very strict requirements uh, from the Swiss National Science Foundation, and uh, uh, many times also from the European Union, in case uh, some of you is still involved uh, with that body, uh, in terms of uh, open data for the data you produce during your research, and uh, open access uh, in terms of the journal uh, uh, publications. And actually, very important, you need to have a strategy uh, on that uh, before uh, writing your paper, not in the last five minutes after the paper is written. So let me actually tell you a little bit more about uh, the communication strategy of uh, Marvel. And uh, as all the NCCR, this goes beyond uh, research and beyond uh, academia. And so when we think about the communication strategy, it's not only, say, the research community, uh, but it's different uh, uh, what we call uh, stakeholders. Uh, uh, stakeholders you can translate also in the way uh, the people that uh, fund your salary. So that's a maybe better way to think <laughs> of them. So these are policymakers. You know, whenever the European Commission, the SNSF, uh, you know, some ministry makes a, a decision on where to invest uh, funding uh, that affects directly what we do, uh, either in terms of, you know, one-off initiative or, you know, in strategic uh, long-term initiatives. And, uh, you know, at the end, uh, the policymakers half of the time are elected, half of the time are chosen by elected policymakers, and for better or for worse, uh, we have democracy all over the place, and so is the public uh, that votes uh, those uh, policymakers, and so the public uh, needs uh, to be convinced that what we do is useful and the policymakers that wants the vote of the public needs uh, to act on, uh, on that. Or there could be enlightened policymakers every now and then that actually believe uh, that you know, scientific research contributes uh, to the uh, wealth and the benefits uh, you know, a society at large. And then there are a sort of other maybe more targeted stakeholders we try to work very much with industry, you know, even in the junior retreat, we had a sort of representative, uh, young and senior from industry, we'll have again sessions uh, in uh, the uh, review and retreat in January. And, you know, many of you actually go and work in industry. So it's very important to understand how research works there and communicate to, you know, prospective industries uh, what we are doing. And then getting closer and closer to academia, you know, national laboratories uh, employ thousands of PhD in research. And because we are a computational center, uh, we work a lot with supercomputing centers. That also means uh, letting the supercomputing centers uh, understand uh, what we are doing and what is needed rather than, uh, you know, the centers themselves are deciding uh, what they think is needed. So that's, uh, if you want, uh, the, the grand plan, all these uh, stakeholders, uh, the policymakers, uh, the, you know, research funding agency, the public at large, 
the industrial partner, the national laboratories, uh, the supercomputing uh, centers. And then, uh, you know, what are our tools? Uh, we'll go in detail uh, with uh, Nicola uh, deep into this. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, right away, uh, the, you know, Marvel uh, website is, uh, you know, a point of reference uh, for everything. And there are uh, indeed uh, uh, the news item, the science highlights, and this will be discussed later that Nicola coordinates. Uh, there are the internal and scientific uh, newsletters. So, you know, if your uh, you know, article is highlighted in the newsletter, uh, right away 400 people uh, in your field know about what you have done. And, you know, some of them will be the people that, uh, you know, might uh, make your job offer, might be in a committee that evaluates uh, a grant of yours, so it might be in a committee that uh, decides on hiring. Uh, these days, uh, you know, uh, X uh, or what used to be Twitter is, uh, you know, a quite useful channel uh, of communication. We have more than 2,000 followers. Uh, and again, you know, these are, you know, all people in computational material sciences. So something is highlighted by Nicole on Twitter and 2,000 people right away uh, know about it. Uh, you publish it in physical radio letter and no one knows about it, okay? I mean, that's the world of these days. Uh, LinkedIn is also very powerful as a community and uh, it'll be interesting also to know about your experience, but these days, uh, you know, a lot of uh, professional interactions and even a lot of job offers go through contact made uh, with LinkedIn. Uh, what is very powerful is the you know subscription to Eureka Alert? That means uh, if uh, you know we have a relevant paper that is going to get published, so you need to do this a month before it appears in press. Uh, we can prepare a press release to this mailing list that is an expensive subscription-only mailing list, and those go to scientific journalists worldwide. And these are the people that then, uh, you know, make an editorial on physics world, on uh, nature materials, and so on and so forth. But, so this is a great communication tool, but uh, Nicola will mention it later. Uh, you need to work, uh, you know, well in advance of your paper being published. Once it's published, it's too old for anything related to press releases. And uh, some of the other information, you know, if all in doubt, uh, you can go to the toolbox of the website and find, uh, you know, appropriate uh, links for acknowledgements, appropriate link for the grant numbers, appropriate link for the uh, open access publications uh, that uh, we'll discuss uh, later. And uh, as part of our communication strategy, we also, you know, meet uh, between uh, ourselves. So we just closed in early September the junior review and retreat in Davos. And uh, once a year, we have a general review and retreat uh, that uh, will be again in Grindelwald uh, under the Eiger, and it will be, so mark your calendar, 17 to 19 of January. Uh, so everyone is invited, and also mark your calendar, 18 and 19 of March is when the SNSF reviews us, and typically 18 is the scientific part in which uh, uh, most of you are involved and these are sort of other internal events as i said you know we need to make sure that uh, you know people believe in what we do and understand why it is relevant so this open doors event that takes place every few years this is you know us at psi i think you can see is it leopold here i don't yeah. know yeah and this is shing and uh Sure, I recognize everyone, but this was sort of our open doors event at PSI, and we just had one at EPFL. These are typically, you know, extremely well attended, so they are great uh, events. And some of, you know, the fun bits that we have done uh, actually by joining forces with SECAM, that is also based here uh, at EPFL, are a two series uh, uh, that we run. One is called the SECAM Marvel Marian Mansai conversation uh, honoring Marianne Mansai, that was the person that wrote uh, all the molecular dyna dynamics code at uh, uh, Livermore, uh, working with Bernie Alder, and she was never recognized as it was a practice, uh, sort of not uh, many years uh, ago. And these are examples of 
say, Eric Dimmer in conversation uh, with uh, Bill Curtin, Eric Dimmer created the materials design, you know, many years ago when no one was thinking yet of the fact that the simulation could actually help the real world of industry and materials. This was another event with the Fondazione Adriano Olivetti uh, about the first personal computer in the world, the Perottina, sort of yeah. program 101 that was launched in, I believe, 1966. Uh, some others, uh, these are actually our new logos that I like very much. The second Marvel Classics, uh, you have just seen uh, last week, the one by Hardy Gross and Angel Rubio on time-dependent density functional theory. is really a library of fundamental methods in simulations. Or uh, instead, uh, if we are more on a sort of up-to-date research, uh, we use the distinguished uh, lectures. So we just had a couple from uh, Claudia Felser and Manos Q. Parkes. And in particular, during the COVID years, uh, the attendance was quite uh, outstanding because, in part, people didn't know what to do with their time and life. <laughs> and uh, we have uh, recorded uh, everything on the materials cloud, the learn section, that actually is being uh, revamped uh, in a major way together uh, with SECAM to become uh, really a wide uh, tool uh, for the community for uh, educational and learning materials. So with this, uh, we get uh, to our guest uh, today, uh, Nicola Nozengo, that uh, I think you'll learn in a moment uh, how we got uh, to meet a few years ago. It was very, very pleasant. This is a, is a short uh, biography, but I think uh, I'll let him uh, take uh, center stage and introduce uh, himself and tell us uh, what he does uh, for Marvel. Very much welcome. Thank you very much, pleasure. Nicola. Thank you very much. It's very nice to be, uh, to be here and meet in person and hopefully also someone uh, online. Um, yes, my, I, I will go on with my self-introduction, but I promise it will be super short and then we'll get to more interesting stuff. Uh, but um, I've been a science journalist for about 20 years, slightly more at this point, since the early 2000s. I don't have a, a hard scientific background from university, which you know may be relevant also for conversations that we will have with some of you regarding studies and stories for the website. So I didn't study neither physics or chemistry, but uh, uh, let's say that over the years, because uh, at some point I started contributing to nature after an internship there back in 2003, and I started to act like a little bit like an Italian correspondent uh, for nature, I began to focus on topics where Italy was producing a lot of news and actually physics, especially particle physics, but also other fields was one of the big topics. So I, I got to uh, cover physics quite a lot. And then I wrote for a number of other publications in particularly in Italy, but also a few outside Italy like Wired, The Economist, etc. cetera. Uh, I, as many, journalists uh, commun slash communicators of my generation have been going back and forth between proper journalism in the classical sense and uh, uh, communication for uh, research institutions and the like. And particularly in Italy, I have worked for the Italian Space Agency and the Italian Institute for Astrophysics. And uh, much more recently, I spent uh, almost four years working here, basically downstairs, uh, where I was uh, the communication officer, so in a similar role for NCCR Robotics, which was a similar project, and NCCR dedicated to uh, embodied AI and robotics that finished uh, last uh, autumn. Um, I am currently working, I am back in Italy, I'm currently working as a chief editor for uh, Nature Italy, which is a, a regional portal of the Nature Group dedicated to covering uh, science uh, research and research policy in Italy. And uh, um, how did we get to know each other? Uh, Nicola Marzari and I, it happened uh, uh, seven years ago. This was uh, 2016 when I was, uh, as I was saying, working quite often for Nature as a contributing journalist. And I wrote a news feature, uh, so a story for the journalistic part of Nature, of course, for the uh, what nature editors call the first half of the of the journal, not the back half with the with the peer review section, uh, about uh, computational material science. And uh, 
let me just say quickly, and then maybe we can, we, if we have time, we can say a bit more about that article and how it came about. But uh, my recollection is that at the time, uh, convincing uh, nature editors to run a story on this topic was probably quite harder than it would be now, because with all the emphasis and all the, you can call it even in a certain percentage hype that is surrounding now AI, machine learning, et cetera, uh, plus the increased focus on sustainability, et cetera. I would say that even in, in publications like Nature News, there is now probably a higher interest in, in these topics and so many more opportunities. Um, I would like now to focus a little bit on one subset of the communication activities that Nicola just presented that uh, comprise the, the overall communication strategy of Marvel, and that are the ones uh, on which I am currently specifically focusing on, and that is mostly the production of stories for the website and uh, the use of the social media, um, the social media profiles. And uh, let me also add that I'm mostly building on the excellent work done through the years by Carrie Sargent, who was doing this job before me. So actually, we are pretty much continuing with the story formats that she was using, although we are starting to experiment a bit more, and hopefully we'll continue doing that in the, in the, in the next few years until the end of the project. So what kind of stories do we publish on the, on the website, and uh, uh, what kind of stories may we um, interact for? The first uh, format that we use is the so-called scientific highlights. So, and we have a target to produce at least a couple per month on average. Uh, they are typically stories going from 600 to 1,000 words in terms of length. Uh, they are about a recent journal publication by Marvel members. Uh, and to consider them for a scientific highlight, they have to be uh, with NCCR Marvel acknowledgement. Uh, in terms of funding. So we normally don't do it on publications by Marvel members, but that for any reason don't, don't have the acknowledgement. We may use other tools for that. Um, what does recent mean? Uh, that's, that, that's always a big question. So at the moment, uh, we are, uh, we are uh, often publishing stories within a few weeks uh, after the, the article is published on the journal. Uh, now, to be honest, uh, here the goal uh, and what uh, I will try to improve from my side a little bit in the next few months would be to shorten this gap, ideally to publish the story when the journal article is out, which would be how you normally do things in, in, uh, in, uh, in scientific news outlets or at least within two weeks from, from publication of the journal. Now, this relies on a certain uh, workflow, which ideally should work like that, with uh, B mean, being uh, notified by the article authors uh, upon the acceptance of the article. The earlier, the better, in general. I would even say, if you have a paper that you think is really strong and you are confident that will get accepted, notify me even when it is in, on Arxiv, when it is on preprint. The, the more I know, the better. Then if it, it isn't accepted, uh, it, it, it's not a problem. But let's say the earlier I, I am notified, the better. And then we will mm, typically uh, schedule an interview. I will need, of course, a, pre, a preview of the, of the paper draft. Uh, we will schedule an online interview on Zoom Meet or similar uh, to clarify any doubts that I may have and to collect a few quotes that are direct quotes are a standard element in the article news article format that we use. Uh, of course, you will always, uh, you, I mean, whoever is chosen, let's say, to do the interview, could be the corresponding author, could be the, 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 the first author. This will typically be a decision for the uh, group of authors to take. Uh, the person who does the interview will have a chance to review the draft, uh, you know, review the science, uh, review the quotes uh, if necessary, etc. Uh, and then we get to publication on the Marvel website. Um, and on the right, you have just, I think, the most recent example uh, from the end of September, um, which was the, the, the scientific light on the on the Koopman's uh, uh, publication. 
Um, just a few more words on scientific highlights, uh, because scientific highlights can uh, also border with press releases, may meaning that there will be cases when uh, we judge that uh, a scientific highlight, uh, uh, a story, a new story about uh, a new journal publication deserves uh, not only to go on the Marvel website, but to be notified to journalists, uh, science journalists around the world in advance so that they can run their own stories timely. Uh, and we have tools to do that. Eureka Alert, as it was mentioned, uh, is, is a typical one. Uh, but there may be others. So, so let me quickly uh, inf tell you a couple of things of, of how this could work. So first of all, again, uh, I should be notified uh, as soon as possible, acceptance, upon acceptance at the very least, uh, maybe even uh, before if you, if you are confident that the paper has good chances. Then there may be cases, of course, when uh, the process is handled or at least uh, involves uh, the uh, media relations office of your institution, which here means uh, Mediacom, uh, the communication office of a PFL or for the other PI, for the other groups in other institutions may mean their own uh, uh, media relation office. So even when they, you know, wh when they take upon that, uh, I would really ask uh, to be uh, kept in copy and to be kept in the loop in the process because there are a number of ways in which we can interact with Mediacom or with the other media relations office from just, you know, reviewing the draft and making sure, for example, that NCCR Marvel is credited explicitly, which doesn't necessarily always happen, uh, to, to, to ensure, to help you ensure that the science is correct, et cetera. There may be cases where you need help to push a story with uh, Mediacom to convince them that it deserves uh, uh, to go also on the PFL website and also to have an accompanying press release. And again, in my past experience with the NCCR Robotics, this has often worked very well. So if you, if you keep me in the loop in the communications, that's something I can help with as well. And in any case, we can always do a Marvel press release using uh, uh, the Eureka Alert service that uh, Nicola was, was mentioning, which is uh, basically a service that distributes uh, press releases in embargo to uh, a enormous, quite enormous list of uh, uh, science journalists around the world. It's uh, managed by the AAAS. And it's actually for free for registered journalists uh, uh, with some vetting, but they must commit to the embargo policy. So basically, you don't pay anything to get it, but if you break the embargo once, you're banned for life. So that's, uh, uh, that's the deal. Um, I didn't say it at the beginning, but please stop me. I mean, I, I, I have some slides to go through, but if you have questions in the, in the middle, please stop me and we can make it this, this a conversation rather than, uh, than a monologue. Um, a second type of, of the stories that we have are the features. We aim to do them a little bit less frequently, probably four or five per year is a credible schedule. They can be a bit longer, the scientific I light. They can get to 1,200 words or something. They are not tied to one publication, to one paper, but they are typically on a larger topic, which could be a project within Marvel, one of the pillars, as is the case of the story we did in June about the quantum computing pillar with an interview to Giuseppe Carleo, but it could also be a scientific trend that is very important within, within Marvel, a discipline, uh, something that you know ties together more groups, more papers, etc. Um, I will typically come up with ideas for features, but of course, any suggestion from any member of Marvel is, is more than welcome. Um, they can include, the, I would say, one to three interviews, so not necessarily limited to one group and one person. They will have a bit more of a more relaxed schedule compared to scientific highlights because they are not tied to a, to a scientific, uh, to a publication day. And again, in this case, of course, you always get to uh, check the, the, the article before it's published. 
Um, then we have the news, the news stories, which are basically whatever be beyond, beyond publications. Uh, they can be awards, they can be new appointments, uh, new positions uh, for, for people or, or new persons joining the consortium, uh, new facilities being open, uh, specific communication and outreach uh, initiatives, uh, and so forth and so on. These are shorter, 400, 600 words. I will typically try to turn them around and publish them as quickly as possible, as soon as I am informed about the news. So even if I reach out to a person to ask some information to, to put in the story, I may not necessarily check back and send the draft for review before publication to shorten time. So if for any reason there is a sensitive topic, like you know third parties, industrial partners, whatever, we need to review, be informed, et cetera, uh, let me know when you when you notify me of the of the upcoming news or when we talk uh, uh, on Zoom to, to collect the content. Um, then we have the profiles, which are Q&A, Q&As with, with the people. Um, at the moment, uh, we typically use them in three areas, which are the Inspire Fellows, so the fellows within the uh, Equal Opportunity Program for um, uh, yeah, the, the Inspire Fellowships, um, new members who joined the consortium, uh, and uh, one uh, recent uh, uh, new section that we opened just a few weeks ago that is called From Marvel to Industry, uh, that right now has three interviews in it. The fourth one will arrive next week, but it's basically a collection of stories and experiences of people who, after their PhD or postdoc in Marvel, went on to work uh, in the industry and who share their tips uh, on you know, how to search for a position, what kind of skills to, to cultivate if you are interested in a career uh, outside academia and in the industry. Um, I had put an asterisk there to uh, address to PIs, but really actually to, to everyone for this new section in particular, if you have any suggestion of past members of your groups, uh, past colleagues, et cetera, who are now doing interesting stuff in the industry, please let, let me know. And for these stories as well, as for the scientific highlights, being a Q&A interview, the person who's interviewed always gets to check the draft and approve it before it is published. Um, to disseminate the stuff, we use uh, mostly two social media, uh, as also Nicola was mentioning, one is of course X, form, formerly known as Twitter, which we use to highlight every new content that is uh, published on the website, um, so that it can reach a larger audience, which actually is not limited to the followers of the Marvel X uh, um, X account, because we are. Uh, uh, typically retweeted by the EPFL account, the EPFL materials and engineering account, etc. So typically uh, our tweets do have a, a much larger impression than, than the actual followers of our profile. Um, we use the X a little bit more for, for things that are of general interest. Of, of people who follow these topics but are not necessarily members of the community. Uh, one important thing is that X, X well, actually typically still call it Twitter, but, but I think we have to uh, learn to call it X, will, uh, is also sometimes a very good alternative to news and scientific highlights when uh, for uh, any reason being, uh, you know, time not being too tight, uh, uh, already having to, enough scientific highlights on the plate for that specific period, or as I said, publications that for any reason do not quote unquote qualify as a scientific highlight, maybe because they don't have the, the Marvel acknowledgement, but they are by members of the consortium. Uh, Twitter posts and Twitter threads can be a great alternative to writing a story on the website and they can often work really quite as well in terms in term of, of disseminating content and highlighting the scientific content of a paper. So 
when you have some paper you want to highlight also, or keep, keep in mind also this suggestion and we can always uh, work together on a Twitter thread that that's something I, I can prepare for a paper. And then we have LinkedIn, which of course has a slightly different audience, a little bit more focused on the, on the community itself. It also has the advantage of course of uh, allowing you to publish uh, longer uh, texts, actually articles in a way. So it, it works quite differently. And it's also a, a very great opportunity that we use uh, again uh, to highlight a little bit more the, uh, the news that are interested for the enlarged Marvel communities, community. Um, a almost final slide on, on uh, where to find me uh, for any of these things for notifying me of interesting stuff coming up or just, you know, for questions regarding communication. Uh, both email addresses work, uh, the EPFL one, uh, nicola.dosengo at epfl.ch and ch and also the Marvel one, which is actually a, a redirect. So I will receive email on, uh, receive messages on that email, but I will not reply from, from it because I, it's, it actually redirects on the other one. And uh, you can also use my, my, my cell number and, what, uh, and, and on WhatsApp for anything really urgent, which may happen in terms of new stories and publications, etc. So this was a very quick overview of the kind of uh, uh, things that I'm focusing on at the moment, but really was this was meant to be a conversation and exchange and, and an opportunity to you know, reflect together on uh, uh, how communication contributes to a project like NCCR Marvel or any curiosity or doubt you may have about uh, how this news coverage comes about. So I will shut up now. And, uh, Great. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks uh, Nicola. Uh, well, I mean, you can. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I mean, if you have questions, you can just uh, uh, raise one and you can think at them. Uh, but in general, it's uh, you know an incredible asset that we have uh, someone like Nicola or before exactly you mentioned Kari uh, in terms of uh, you know responsiveness and knowledge. Uh, of uh, you know what goes on in the world at uh, all these uh, different uh, all these different levels, and uh, as I said, you know, for better or for worse, uh, I mean it's you know an important message. You know, all of you tend to be focused on you know an incredibly sort of telescopic and narrow thing that is working on your PhD, working on your research, but. The research is not anymore this, you know, very narrow telescopic focus, and uh, it's very important uh, to understand how it works. It's very important uh, to let people know of what is happening, also because just the modes in which uh, science is communicated is changed. You know, when I was a PhD student, we would receive a physical review B in CISA, you know, once uh, uh, every two weeks, and people would just uh, read the physical review B or physical review letters because these were the only two journals that were worth, you know, uh, looking up, and they were very uh, thin. So one could keep track of everything that goes on worldwide. I mean, now these days, uh, uh, actually, no one looks at journals anymore. They are just there as a sort of, you know, reference, basically, and uh, you know, people get to know about things happening. Uh, to all these other channels. Tommaso. Uh, yes, no, I have, uh, um, I have many questions, so I will focus uh, for brevity on, uh, on some. So first question is, so do you think that, um, so because I, exactly as Nicola said, so let's say it's one of the problems for our community, but I think that science in general is uh, the fact that uh, our research is read, is acknowledged and uh, read and acknowledged. I, I think it's uh, indeed the journal, uh, journal public, I mean, scientific journal publication, they help in that. Uh, the fact that our research is read is another thing, let's say. Uh, so, personally, what I do is that uh, I have, uh, I have uh, Twitter, let's say, I have uh, X, and uh, I follow Physical Review Bay, uh, I, follow, I follow Physical Review Later, I follow these accounts, let's say, and so I know what articles they come out, and I think that this should become a standard practice. I think it's the only way, actually, to be 
um, actually to be uh, exact, exact, exactly as when uh, um, uh, the, 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 the people were receiving uh, at home, let's say, these journals. Now we receive those uh, those uh, those tweeters, and uh, and, uh, and and I think that this is the only way to keep track, let's say. So I want to know your opinion about this. And uh, on this, actually, so knowing how much our research has impact is simple. You you just see the number of retweets. Let's say right. Yeah. So in so in some sense, so I mean, uh, taking us out the chatbot stuff. Let's say if there were no chatbots, of course, the, the number of retweets it means that actually people have read your 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 post and are retweeting it, right? So so on Twitter, I would be I, I know to count. Now on a, on a web page instead, it's much more difficult. So how, how many people have read that web page? I have understood it. So 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 you understand so, so you understand the point. But the point is uh, like the, the 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 research highlights, for example, right? So how do you know that people read them? It's different from Twitter. Would you recommend one or the other? Would you prefer? I would I would say both for sure. But I would say Twitter is more controllable in this in this aspect because you see the number of retweets so do you agree on this or not so this is the, first, the this is the question so do i agree on the fact that uh, all considered twitter is more impactful than uh, no, than a website uh, that, and more controllable so because indeed so we publish the research i write and you never know how much they are read so do you do you think it's a, it's it's, a, it's an issue or not so do you see the issue so um, I mean, of course, I see that the general issue of uh, uh, measuring and knowing what is the actual reception mm -hmm. of a scientific content online, which is by definition, uh, well, depending on who reads, but uh, on definition, not super accessible. Uh, you know, it has a number of barriers, etc. I don't think I fully agree in in a number of ways. What you measure on Twitter is a very easy interaction. I mean, it, it doesn't cost a lot. It's true. It's, it's very easy to check the number of retweets and the number of likes, but it doesn't uh, really say a, much, uh, say a lot about uh, how much that content has been, you know, assimilated, put in context, uh, uh, et cetera. There are a lot of instinctive reactions on Twitter, which, are nice to see when you are actually in the business of measuring the impact of communication. They are actually very nice to see because it's, I won't say it's easy, but it's never easy, but it can be easy to get to hundreds of retweets, et cetera, especially with some topics. But it's, that's not necessarily a measure of, of how impactful the, the, the story has been. So I think it's a great tool with a lot of clouds on its future because you know, everything going around now, actually, uh, if you follow, and as I think you follow the, the scientific community discussion on Twitter, people keep saying they want to move uh, to Mastodon or somewhere else. They are not doing it for the moment. Most, almost everyone is still there. So it's still a very powerful tool. Surely much more uh, impactful and useful for scientific communication than, I don't know, Facebook, which is dead, uh, Instagram, which is cool for lay communication, but not for, for communication between scientists. So great tool, but uh, I actually think that the, you know, old fashioned uh, news article is uh, still, and, I mean, th there are ways to measure. I mean, of course you can, you can easily uh, count uh, clicks, page views, etc. You have these metrics. They will often be less uh, flattering than the, retweets and likes on, on, on Twitter. Uh, but still, there are a number of things you can see, you know, how much time people spend on the page, etc. You can actually track these things. And, uh, and in general, they can be often more valuable than, than the retweets. So I think they're complementary. I wouldn't choose one of the two. Uh, but I, I probably, to make it very short, I'm probably not 100% in, in agreement with a consideration that Twitter is. Now, this, if I can also interject, uh, uh, raises, you know, really a, a, an incredibly important question. Uh, that is, mm. uh, you know, there is always uh, the push that, you know, also comes from us to communicate, uh, and then you get satisfied by something that gets a lot of resonance. But, you know, the work that gets a lot of resonance, exactly the more shallow the platform is, uh, is the more, let's say, popular work. 
you know, we publish a paper on 2D materials, we get thousands of citations. But somehow, you know, it's because there is a huge community that uh, looks at it. Uh, we publish something on very advanced and very exotic, and there are only three people reading at it. And, you know, it was very interesting, uh, you know, the story of yesterday, uh, the Nobel Prize in Medicine. I've forgotten uh, the names of both, so I'm quite uh, good at both. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the woman that is now in Hungary uh, didn't really get tenure at uh, uh, I think it was in no, Pennsylvania. Uh, Pennsylvania. Pen yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, they she's, kicked her out. Yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. Because she wasn't getting uh, uh, grants uh, because no one uh, believed in uh, mRNA technology. And uh, I'm not saying uh, that one should you know, engage uh, in science that doesn't get any recognition, but uh, you know, it's, a, it's a very slippery slope that each of us needs to take a choice. Uh, in realizing that you know certain areas are popular, but they might be also exhausted, and a lot of you know interesting science is taking place in the area that are not uh, that are not popular. It's very you know difficult to navigate this earlier on, uh, and somehow it helps you know just working on things that you truly believe on. But yeah, science is not only a popularity contest, and popularity contest can go wrong exactly as the you know uh, mRNA case yeah. demonstrated. And if we can, if I can add the two very quick things, uh, again with respect to Twitter versus website comparison, uh, website is durable. I mean, and searchable much more than content on 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 Twitter, which is basically you know has a flame of visibility, but but. Uh, kind of get, get, get lost in a few weeks. And that in a communication strategy, that's important because things will uh, be, remain relevant much more if they are in the article website format. And um, yeah, another really quick thing, but just this may sound cheesy, but even the, even the um, topics that are supposed to be less accessible and less popular in the um when they are addressed at the right target and they when they are written nicely as they should be they can often have a surprising impact i, I will speak just for a second from my other experience as as the nature italy editor of course that is a niche publication so it's mostly read by, by people who are somehow in the research world so it's not popular science, etc. Uh, but still, there are obviously topics that work a bit more, medicine, animals, etc., for, for the usual reasons. Uh, but for example, when, when I see the stats, I very detailed stats, stats for that website because I manage it. And when we did, uh, it was a few weeks ago, maybe some months ago this spring, um, we, we only cover Ita uh, science coming from Italy. So it's you know, the, the pool is a bit more narrow. But when we did a story about uh, DFT, actually, about computational material science, with a writer who was very good and, and wrote it very, very, very well, but it was, in principle, definitely not a, a very accessible paper, but it was one of the most read stories, at least in that format, in that category of, of, of that whole period. So, again, uh, when things are are written good by someone who knows how to write uh, new stories, etc. And when they are addressed to the right audience, they can sometimes be surprising, even for you know hard topics and not super easy papers. I'm actually very proud. I wrote a story on density functional theory for L'Espresso for the Christmas issues. Wow. <laughs> uh, other questions. What, did you, what is your op or opinion or policy about preprints? Because I see on Twitter that there are a lot of, of groups that uh, are, as, as soon as the paper is on archive, they, yeah. then they start uh, uh, advertising it. And then they, there is a second peak of, uh, of this uh, when the paper is published and yes. maybe other peaks. So... Uh, I am actually quite open-minded towards it. I think we had a discussion uh, about this topic when 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 I started, and maybe Nicola was a bit uh, a bit um, I don't know more cautious about it. I what I see, maybe you can tell me 
better than I can. But what I see, especially in the physics community, is that you know, waiting for the journal publication is probably becoming less and less crucial for the community. There are even major uh, news publications, non-specialistic ones, that have now for a long time been covering uh, preprints as if they were news. Uh, the Economist, for example, started to do it quite a long time ago. And in the medical field with the pandemic, that blew up because at some point uh, all the interesting COVID stuff was appearing on, on uh, preprint archives. So it's kind of been, uh, it has been, um, you know, uh, I have the Italian word, but not the English one anyway. It's doganato, but uh, it's, it's kind of accepted now. Um, so I, my personal position as a, as a journalist and writer is that, you know, when you have a preprint that looks really strong and maybe you ask a couple of scientists uh, who have nothing to do with the paper and who you trust and they tell you it looks solid, they should be covered. That's, that's my opinion. Yeah, it's a bit difficult, but after a while uh, you learn to recognize the style of a group. <laughs> and uh, there are, uh, you know, PIs uh, across the world that, you know, are sort of, you know, dedicated to self-promotions, PIs that you never hear a word. It's a somehow personal choice at the end yeah. where to find the, the limit, and the limit is ever-changing, basically. So that what is accepted today would have been considered unacceptable 20 years ago. So I think, um, you know, everyone should make uh, their own choice. But back to the question, uh, probably, yeah, the preprint are, uh, you know, interesting and relevant, and uh, somehow in you know, one way or the other, uh, journals, you know, these days there are so many journals that you know, almost everyone takes uh, the, the you know, path of the, you know, you send it to a journal, it doesn't go, maybe go to another journal. Whatever. Again, I don't really agree personally with that uh, path, uh, but somehow the archive is a very nice uh, way. Actually, the archive uh, is also uh, incredibly interesting as a model because uh, it's accessible to everyone uh, worldwide. Uh, and uh, so there are you know, a lot of places where actually you can't uh, access journals. And so the archive is the only source. Uh, um, and also very interesting, you know, I'm always fascinated by this fact uh, that uh, even if you publish, and this uh, will do that in the last five minutes, uh, uh, you know, on a gold uh, license uh, that should be, you know, whatever the most ideal thing. Most journals uh, forbid uh, automatic scrapings uh, of uh, gold yes. license uh, um, papers. Uh, and uh, since, uh, for better or for worse, in the future, we use a lot of AI enabled tools uh, to do our searches. Uh, in reality, even if you publish it gold, uh, you have removed uh, that uh, from the pool. So you think. Uh, uh, you are doing it, uh, uh, you know, you are uh, uh, increasing the accessibility of your paper by publishing it gold, but in reality, the only accessible strategy is the archive. Uh, this is at variance uh, with the guidelines from the Swiss National Science Foundation that I'll mention in a while, and that, uh, again, to me, don't make sense. I mean, I can explain uh, why they think uh, they make sense, uh, but in reality, um, and it's something we cannot do, but the only appropriate way would be publishing papers on the archive because everyone in the world reads them and everyone in the world can manipulate them uh, however they see fit. Yeah. More questions from the wide online audience or from the present audience? So maybe I'll ask, uh, I, I want to dedicate the last five minutes okay. of this important uh, policy matter, but it's also nice. So you have seen many communities, uh, you know, you uh, yes. sort of mentioned the particle physics, the robotics, here is more the computational material science and different countries. And I suppose, uh, you know, each of these communities is somehow different, or maybe that's the question. Do you find that uh, communities uh, communicate different or operate differently? Or uh, we are all sort of, uh, you know, in the same way. Huh, that's so a big question. To say, you know, every happy family is happy. Uh, yeah, family. and they are happy, are <laughs> and happy in their own way. Yeah. Um, 
I don't know. That's a big question. Uh, in terms of uh, country wise, uh, yes, there are there are uh, there are differences. Uh, let's say in a continuum from uh, the the communities that are more you know by now more uh, communication ready, etc. You have probably the the US and also the UK. In my perception, at yeah. Yeah. one end where, where there is a very strong culture of communication. Yeah. Uh, from my point of view as a science journalist, people there, you know, always answer your email, always answer your phone. They are very, they have their story ready to tell about yeah. their, yeah. the top, their field, their paper, etc. cetera. Um, Italy, for example, you know, new generations, much better, but uh, still not a lot of... Um, I have to say, I'm being recorded probably, but my experience, for example, of, of Switzerland is a bit halfway as a as a yeah. as a, um, yeah. as a general communication uh, atmosphere. Meaning that because maybe because funding is generally secured and on a very comfortable level, there is at the institutional level maybe less pressure, less need for effective yeah. communication, yeah. although the individual people are yeah. often often very good. Uh, the different communities, uh, um, again, I would say probably the, the medical community, and this also at the boost with the pandemic, uh, are 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 the ones that are more used to you know make the connection between their work whatever they do sometimes very basic very blue sky and uh, you know highlight possible applications etc they have as a community learned that game uh, very well in general um, while in other fields that may be less less so and um, yeah, robotics AI community, of course. Now yeah. they're they're uh, you know yeah. benefiting from this from from this. Yeah, no, you know, sort of abundance of resources is double edged uh, because it makes uh, communities complacent. And uh, uh, as Jesus said, uh, it's uh, easier for a camel to go through a needle than for a you know wealthy person <laughs> in the kingdom of heaven. And so there is a there is a point uh, in being. Uh, uh, I guess one of the few things that uh, Steve Jobs said right, uh, you know, said that uh, be hungry and be foolish in that famous commencement speech, I think, at, uh, at Stanford. So remember that uh, uh, the resources uh, sometimes uh, stop you from doing things. Well, constraints are a great uh, yeah. asset yeah. because yeah. they yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. all kinds of constraints. Of Creativity is driven yeah. by. Okay, is there a, a last question? No, if not, uh, I mean, stay on. I mean, yeah, I just sure. let me thank again uh, Nicola for. No, thank you. Know, this, uh, and let me just uh, go very quickly some of these things. But, you know, remember, we'll post the slides, uh, we'll post uh, the video. And, uh, you know, it's just a great asset uh, to have him here. Now, let, let me go through. Um, both, uh, you know, official policy of the SNSF, but also of many other funding agencies. But many of you are funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation. So, you know, these days, uh, you know, research proposals uh, at the end are evaluated also uh, uh, on the data sets that have been published. So this is, you know, I, at the end of every proposal, I have to painfully go through all the data sets. So it's fantastic that we have the materials cloud archive, where you actually are expected to publish your data so to make your research reproducible. And uh, we are, uh, you know, Materials Cloud is one of the official repository of the SNSF, in particular for materials data, and it's actually an official repository of nature, scientific data, and uh, of the um, uh, European Commission through open research data. And it's actually the only journal, quote unquote, that I read. So I look at what's happening by looking at the uh, uh, um, Materials Cloud Archive data. And then uh, let me give you a summary of what is the legal status 
of uh, you know the different uh, uh, publication strategies that they have uh, names, uh, but uh, in a moment uh, we'll see what are admissible and what are not. Uh, the gold road, you know, uh, one has to pay for it, uh, and uh, it's on a completely open access uh, uh, journals. And then there is the hybrid road uh, that is, uh, you know, in the closed uh, access journal but uh, where you can also get access to this uh, journal. There is the green road, uh, a little bit uh, like it could be on the archive or uh, in closed access journals where, again, you pay to make it open access and the diamond road. I mean, I get myself lost when I go through this, but maybe it's good to look at the guidelines. So that is, uh, if you publish uh, gold, you have to pay but uh, the fees are eligible for uh, reimbursement. Uh, and that is very uh, interesting. Uh, now, if you go to the hybrid uh, road, uh, the fees are not uh, eligible for reimbursement. And you know, these fees are three, 4,000 francs, 10,000 francs in case of very famous journals. So it can be you know, a significant uh, expense, and not that. It's not here, the expenses that someone else uh, pays uh, for it. Uh, what was uh, very, very good uh, was the green road of the archive, but from the point of view of the SNSF, uh, you know, you needed uh, to publish on the archive your paper within uh, six months, and now at the same time, basically, now we are in this uh, sort of compliance rule, uh, that is, uh, you have to do it uh, immediately when the paper uh, is uh, published. Uh, um, now, why the author accepted manuscript is not enough? It's, it's enough. Uh, ah, sorry. The author accepted manuscript is good. Uh, it's not the submitted version. So the problem here is that the journal says that uh, in going from the submitted version to the author accepted, uh, uh, there is an editorial uh, element uh, to which the journal participates. Uh, and so not all journals are willing uh, to do this. Uh, but you were saying the APS journals are willing uh, to do that. Uh. So it's a little bit of a complicated uh, uh, landscape. A landscape that could have been made very easy. You know, the SNSF could have just said, uh, you know, publish an archive and we are very happy. For some reason, no, and for some reason, all the other funding agencies, uh, for mysterious, uh, you know, marginal reasons, uh, because you know the difference uh, between uh, uh, the submitted version and the other accepted version in most cases is marginal. But uh, for this marginality, we sort of you know break our heads uh, around these things. Uh, luckily, Lydia is here to help, uh, and uh, Tommaso. No, yes. Yeah, so sorry. So just just a clarification now. So. If we publish an archive, uh, something that is not uh, accepted yet, it doesn't count. So if we publish on a, on a closed access journal, but uh, we, we, we publish also an archive, the version that is, was not accepted, but the version that was submitted, does it count? Do you care? No, no. And, uh, you know, only one uh, is uh, accessible, and that's what it is. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, know. so if you publish in, uh, in a journal where there is an embargo, for example, then uh, you don't have the right to, to share the accepted manuscript before the end of the embargo. You can share the submitted version in some case, not in all, depend of the journal. So you can find all the, the rules. If you go on the Sherpa Romeo uh, website, there is a aggregate all the rules of the different journals. But um, then, um, so it's, it depends. And usually um, it's really a big difference between physics and chemistry. So in physics, there is a culture of open access and of archive. And in fact, uh, the main journal in physics, uh, they accept the green road and they have uh, no or 
little embargo. In chemistry, there is a culture of closing. And uh, in the journal in chemistry, you will find two years embargo sometimes in the green road. So, and I think this is a question that you should check before choosing the, the journal where you want to publish. You should say, okay, I want to publish in this, this journal, and then I will go and see the rules. And then, depending on the rule, then you can see if you can do the, the things or not. For example, if uh, there is an, an hybrid road and you have to pay, if it's uh, uh, not too expensive, then it's okay if you have the money. But then if you have to, to pay 10,000 francs for publishing uh, open access, then maybe it's exaggerate. Yeah, so in some ways, uh, it's good uh, to work uh, with a few port a selected portfolio of journals that we know they comply. So that's why I like a lot of MPJ computational materials or physical review research because they are exactly compliant. They are fully open access. I mean, one has to pay three, 4,000 per paper. I mean, we can actually get the SNSF to pay for that and uh, uh, that sort of streamlines and simplifies, but sometimes they might not be the most uh, appropriate uh, for you. Okay, I think uh, uh, I conclude here. We have, uh, again, uh, a few sort of places. Uh, you can always start, I think, uh, from the toolbox, uh, and then there is a link uh, for the open publication and the links uh, for uh, everything else. So this, all these links uh, are uh, present. Uh, and actually, this is a good uh, uh, point. You know, remember that there is a, a huge number of, uh, well, predatory conferences and predatory journals that are fake. They are just, you know, money-making machine, they give you an invited talk, but then, you know, no one cares about that invited talk. It's just a matter of getting uh, your conference fees, or they invite you to be, a, you know, to curate maybe a submission uh, for, a, for a, a journal. Uh, some of these are not very far away from, uh, from here. And, uh, um, uh, and you know, most of the time is a waste of time. So again, you know, work with just a few journals that you trust and few conferences that you trust. Cool. I think we are done. Thanks again to Nicola. Thanks Zendo. again. Great pleasure to have you here. And thank you all for coming. Okay.